Thanks for that, Rachel. Great overview. So let's go into relevance. Um, I mean, as clinicians, we generally know why this is important, right? But let's be a little more specific. So before we even get into the big gritty here, I think it's helpful to zoom out on our methods for diagnosis. Uh, why, first of all, we diagnose, but then what leads to a diagnosis? Is it a matter of the way we're looking at a case that leads to a certain diagnosis? Is it the questions we're asking, the language we're using, our theoretical orientation as clinicians? I'm of the opinion that the way we look at things alters our perception. So based on that understanding, I think the way that we look at a case of youth having difficulties can lead to a certain diagnosis and then leads to certain treatments and then certain outcomes. So some examples of maybe mimicry or camouflaging, which Rachel touched on, but I might get a little more specific. Uh, attention deficit uh, hyperactive disorder. If a child is coming in being referred, let's say by parents or school uh, authorities for interpersonal conflict or aggression, or give them a diagnosis of ADD, uh, excuse me, ODD, oppositional defiance. If we dig a little deeper, this hyperactivity leading to interpersonal conflict could be ADHD. Financial abuse. Let's say a client, a young kid comes in, or a teen, adolescent, I mean, doesn't even mention anything about financial control from parents. This, it's not a question asked, so it's not a question answered. But then going into new uh, romantic relationships, they may be quick to leave. Maybe they have a date and they don't want to uh, accept help for payment of that date, for instance, and then they decide to leave. We could be very quick if we use our attachment theory lens to say, ah, they're avoidant. They don't, they don't want to be in a relationship or they're scared of it or they're making bids for a connection, but they also have the subconscious need to detach. Oh, avoidant. Well, we didn't ask any questions about abuse. We didn't ask any questions about financial abuse. So there's layers to this, right? Same thing with if they come in with major depression or social anxiety, uh, even borderline. Because we say, ah, they're sensitive to rejection. There's this push, pull, and attachment where they're quick to latch and then quick to detach, or they're super distractible. Well, Let's say that they're exploring their, their queer sexual identity and they're navigating all these social norms and probably they've internalized some messaging from their family and society. So when they get into that first relationship, can we imagine what may be going through their inner experience? Yeah, probably sadness. Yeah, probably nervousness. Yeah, probably distraction and rejection sensitivity. It means more to them than just this one relationship. Um, even, even BPD, right? Like if they're quick to latch, quick to detach, it could be just fears that are hard to uh, announce or put language to, especially if we don't have language around the queer phobia, which many adolescents would not. Even moving into racially charged arrest or racism, even generational gaslighting, right? There's an over uh, diagnosis of schizophrenia, uh, particularly for African-American males. Uh, this comes from a book called Protest Psychosis, and their reasoning is uh, this is actually a societally induced crazy making. That's their theory. So if we're overloading diagnosis of schizophrenia because we see this presentation of all visions or talking to God, cross-culturally, if we look in other, other uh, more traditional or indigenous cultures, schizophrenia is not a in the language or the lexicon. It's actually considered shamanism and channeling. So again, the way we're looking at a person and the way that they're behaving alters our, our reasoning, our diagnosis. And a last example would be, if a client comes in very aggressive, hardcore, pushing at you, confronting, boundary violation, emotion to fire. Let's say that they're a female. Maybe we're gonna direct our attention to BPD. Let's say that they're male. Maybe we're gonna latch onto the pathway of NPD, narcissism, right? Just based on our perceptions here, maybe if we have biases. In general, we have them in this industry based on diagnoses and symptomology. 
Truthfully, emotional reactivity could be a version of depersonalization. Like Rachel was saying, that flight reaction, that quick to fire, amped up. But we don't necessarily know that from the get-go. All of this is to say, things are not always what they seem. Moving forward then generally, or actually more specifically to CPTSD, complex post-traumatic stress. We can borrow from the language of like biomedical models around immunology. There are some autoimmune disorders like sarcoidosis that are considered the great mimicker of other diagnoses because they have overlap in a lot of different symptomology. Oh, you have shortness of breath. Oh, low vitamin D. Oh, you have chronic fatigue and, and arthritic pains. Uh, oh, you have rashes. Maybe we're going to go look at lupus. No, it turns out maybe if we do biopsies, we find sarcoidosis, right? So in autoimmune speak, disorders can mimic each other, camouflaging the chameleons, right? So our theory here is can complex post-traumatic stress act in the DSM world as the great mimicker? could look like a lot of different things. So Van der Kolk, who writes Body Keeps the Score, mentions this perfect storm, exposure to extreme stress chronically, maybe an emergence of PTSD symptoms that look like acute stress reactions to traumatic reactions of events. Don't love the term, it's rooted in sexism, but hysteria-like symptoms, like stimulus discrimination. Uh, so biases and judgment, self-regulation, right? That hard, quick to fire, hard to come down. Cognitive integration of the experience. Maybe they're dissociating every time we, we mention a topic or it feels very much in the present if it's even if it's 10, 20, 30 years ago. All of those things have combined to look like other things when really maybe a more accurate label would be CPTSD. There's also been some recent articles, um, particularly one from 2017 called Cold Carney, with the title of, is CPTSD a more accurate description of borderline personality? So if you check out this really simple but appropriate visual of a diagram here, complex PTSD is in the middle. It has all the same symptomology as BPD. BPD might have a few other outliers that aren't similar to CPTSD and PTSD. CPTSD also has all of the same symptomology as PTSD. And even there's a lot of overlap between BPD and PTSD. So how do we even start to unpack this? If it all looks very, very similar. Some suggested uh, proposals would include revising the diagnosis for PTSD itself. So the one that we currently have in the DSM specifying and tightening the definition of what trauma is and what trauma is in terms of PTSD, um, specifically to address that vagueness of trauma in general, big T, little t, huge, uh, <laughs> huge uh, like umbrella term, right? And we hear a lot of clients come and say, I've experienced trauma. Very well, they probably have, but that's a huge uh, ideation of our experience. And really, trauma means the reaction to an event, right? So we constantly have to keep that in mind. Just knowing the heterogeneity, the vastness of symptoms for PTSD that can kind of be captured under this umbrella term, uh, following victimization, following a very difficult challenge in our, in our experience for me, for helpless and powerless, actually may lead to uh, falling through the cracks. We're not getting uh, specified enough. Same thing with maybe let's delete acute stress disorder and add a new V code for non-pathological and non-disordered reactions to stress. Maybe they experience a lot of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, but maybe they're presenting pretty uh, well-functioning, as we call it. Well, maybe we shouldn't give them PTSD if they're not having those heterogeneous, but homology they need uh, to just say non-pathological stress and also taking into account delayed onset, set, meaning PTSD, even CPTSD may not emerge until many years or even decades later. So if we think even about BPD, it may, those symptomology, those uh, 
I love you, but don't, I hate you, but don't go push pull might not. And like the emotional reactivity might not emerge in full presentation until let's say a parent passes away. Same thing with CPTSD or even PTSD. Might be smooth sailing for a decade. Great job in family, you know, by all means on the surface looks good. But then parent dies, let's say, and it all comes flooding back. So we need to be cautious of a delayed onset for both diagnoses. Which begs the question, what if many of our diagnoses are actually complex trauma? That has a lot of implications. One for, di for the DSM in general, but also how we think about treatment. That's gonna be better for our youth if we're more specific in what's the origin of what's going on here and how can I better serve you? But there's probably going to be pushback from the industry if this is our way of thinking, our way of believing for so long. And this is the, the Bible for lack of a better, well, I guess it's a great, uh, symbol, right? This is our lexicon. This is where we go to, to understand what's happening in the world. Now you're telling me that maybe none of those are really that accurate. Maybe they don't even exist. And it's really all trauma to be very simplified, but let's pretend. Of course, now we're going to have years long delays in that ICD-11, which we see now. Just our own resistance to change, but also in the industry insurance implications and our treatments, our theories, everything. So something I, I think about personally, it's like, let's, let's pretend that the DSM isn't an accurate capture at all. And maybe it is CPTSD, but that's not an, even a formal diagnosis yet. And maybe it will, maybe it won't be. And, and maybe we get to that point where the CPTSD diagnosis is in there and it's not even that accurate, right? Like good, it's a good, next step, but what's after that even? I think a lot of us counselors get to that point of, sure, diagnoses are helpful for our youth, but only to so far of a degree. In my opinion, I feel like a biomedical classification, a let's pin down the symptomology and let's find a diagnosis for you is a lot like fighting fire with fire. Client comes in lit up by all these issues and we're like, Let's, let's nail this down. Let's fix this. Let's change this. Here's how we're going to do it. I'm giving you a label. We're working with this experience. And now here's the treatment. You know, very, my perception here, but I feel like it's fighting fire with fire. I'm going to propose, let's plant the seed. What if we can love the fire that clients come in with and sit with the fire next to them and in the fire with them? So instead of let's try and quick, quick, quick sort out what's a more accurate diagnosis, let, we got to like pin this down and be super accurate and specific. What if we befriend ambiguity? What if we love the unknown in the room? What if we love the unknown in treating? What if we love the messiness and the fire that comes in in our client? What if we surrender to our fallible ways of understanding what's going on? You know, the DSM is an attempt to understand what if we love that we have this messiness in our shared humanity. Imagine if we can come in with that stance into the room, how we can model that tolerance for ambiguity to our clients. I don't know necessarily the origin of what this is. I don't know where it started. I don't know where it's going to end, but I'm here with you and I'm going to sit with this fire with you. I think there's a lot of power there. And our clients can feel it, particularly our youth. So let's move on here. Deep breaths, and then we'll move on to Renee's section. All right. Thank you, Allison. 